thank you for that very, very kind introduction. It is a great pleasure to be working with you again uh, as we did, it must be uh, some 30 or 40 years ago uh, and subsequently. <coughs> you are the Founders Company. Uh, I was asked to talk on a topic which is suitable for you. I suggested the title Muck and Metal, but it should really be uh, mining and uh, metalworking in ancient Britain. Now, I, I've provided a handout. Uh, lawyers always produce skeleton arguments before they address a court. There are many reasons for that. One is sometimes the judge dozes off or his attention falters, uh, uh, but he's still got it there in writing, so all, all is well. Uh, another is that if people get bored with the presentation, would like to know later what it said, there you are, you've got the gist. Now, as I say in paragraph one, uh, uh, metalworking was the, uh, top, uh, the top technology of the ancient world. Whoops, uh, I'm not so good at technology. I'll try again. There we are. Uh, Vulcan was the uh, Roman uh, smith god, and most ancient uh, religions had a smith god. Uh, Hephaestus, of course, was the Greek smith god, and I put the name of the, uh, Nor of the Norwegian one there. I can't, uh, the Scandinavian one there, I can't pronounce his name, but he was the chap who made the hammers for Thor for the purpose of uh, thunder and lightning. So the smith was a very respected figure in the ancient world. Now, what was the position in Britain? As I said in paragraph two, uh, our ancestors started producing bronze here about 4,000 years ago. There was a plentiful supply of, of tin uh, from Cornwall. There was copper uh, to be obtained from Wales uh, and so forth. Uh, and so the uh, bronze was made as an alloy. I'm pleased to see that the founders have a great uh, affection for bronze. Uh, David, your, your master, has shown me uh, the bronze casts, which you've recently acquired upstairs, made out of uh, an alloy of tin and copper, just like our ancestors were producing 4,000 years ago. Our ancestors were not just uh, producing it, they were also exporting it to the uh, continent. And it wasn't until about 800 BC, the beginning of the Iron Age, that iron replaced bronze as the principal hard metal uh, in this country. Uh, everyone had uh, their Iron Age at different times. The Iron Age started earlier in the Mediterranean region, but here in Britain it started in about 800 BC, and it effectively lasted until the Roman conquest. Now, uh, as I say in paragraph three of my handout, uh, processing iron was not an easy task. Indeed, the founders company will all know that very well. The, uh, the, 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 the tribesmen in Britain had to make charcoal by heating up wood very uh, greatly, but not allowing it to burn. Then they had to use the charcoal <coughs> to burn it at high temperatures in order to extract the iron from the ore. <coughs> Blacksmiths would then beat the, uh, beat the iron into iron bars or whatever was uh, required. When Julius Caesar came to Britain uh, uh, and he visited us in AD, 54, uh, uh, AD 55 and 54, he noted the way iron was used. By the way, a, a visit from Julius Caesar is always an invasion, uh, so he invaded us twice. He didn't annex Britain as uh, a province. He merely invaded it and killed as many people as he could and seized what uh, booty he could. Anyway, he says, if I can move it on one, in his Gallic Wars, that the Britons he encountered used iron bars as currency. And um, here is a set of iron bars which I encountered at the Iron Age Museum uh, in, uh, uh, in somewhere in Hampshire, the name of which will come to me in a moment. Anyway, th this was on display, and you can see a number of these sets of iron bars in Iron Age museums around the country. Now, I would have thought 
that those iron bars are very inconvenient as small change. <laughs> but what you can see is that the ends, I, I think this thing will, yeah, the ends of these bars are usually twisted. Now, my speculation is that the twisting at the ends of the bars was to show their good quality. And I would have thought that people who, uh, uh, that obviously these bars would be used for manufacturing other items, but they could, al they could also stand as currency because you could say, well, here is an iron bar of substantial value, look at its quality, and so it could be bartered for something else. Uh, that's the only way I can make sense of the statement in Caesar's Gallic Wars that the Britons were using iron bars as currency. Now, Celtic art emerged in Britain uh, a, a, and across continental Europe during the Iron Age, uh, a, and uh, some very fine uh, uh, artistry was achieved. I describe in my paragraph four a very ornate, a very ornate sword, a very ornate shield, and so forth. But a, a fine example of Celtic art uh, using metal is the uh, Snettisham Hoard. This is a hoard of uh, Iron Age objects, or Celtic art recovered from Snettisham uh, in, in, in Britain. You can see torques which go around the neck uh, and all sorts of other items. These are all made from gold. So uh, during the Iron Age, the Celtic peoples in Britain and across Europe were producing very fine, uh, very fine uh, metalwork. Another example of the metal worker being a very respected craftsman. Some of you may have seen the uh, Celtic exhibition at the British Museum about five or six years ago when this hoard and many other items were on display. Now, going back to my skeleton argument, I make the point in paragraph five that tin mining didn't stop with the end of the Iron Age. Nobody said, well, the Iron Age is over, chaps, you can't go on making and exporting tin. Uh, that continued uh, through the Iron Age as well. Now, of course, during that period, the center of civilization was Greece. In the uh, 5th century and the 4th century BC, uh, culture centered largely upon Athens and the surrounding cities. There were the plays of Aeschylus, uh, Euripides, and so forth being written. The great philosophers laying the foundation of modern thinking, uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. That's what was going on uh, in the Mediterranean region, whilst up in Britain we were uh, tribesmen whose greatest achievement was uh, producing very fine metalwork. Well, what did the uh, Greeks know about us? The answer is not a lot. Herodotus, in his famous history of the Persian War, writes quite a lot about the geography of the world. He describes Egypt and and what is thought about the source of the Nile and so forth. But when it comes to Britain, he only gives us one half of a sentence. He says, of the tin islands from which our tin comes, I know absolutely nothing. <laughs> that is the sole uh, way in which we feature uh, in uh, classical Greek writing in the fifth century. Well, that was Herodotus's rather cutting observation. Anyway, after a couple of centuries, the Greeks began to wonder where their tin did come from, because this tin was traded across Europe, so uh, nobody from Britain came and sold it to them. It would be a series of traders that, that, that sent it to them across the continent. Anyway, a famous Greek explorer called Pythias decided to go and find out. Now, here's a picture of Pythias. Uh, as you can see, he's holding a globe uh, he was very interested in geography. He's got Europe and, and Asia shown uh, on his globe. Uh, and he set off on a great voyage of exploration to find out about Britain. What is this place where our tin comes from? He set off uh, in about 320 BC. He wrote a very excellent account of his voyage in a, in a book called uh, uh, About the Ocean. Sadly, that book has now been lost but there are quite a lot of quotes from it 
in other ancient works which have survived, and we can roughly piece together what Pythias had to say about Britain. He arrived in Britain, he circumnavigated the country, he gave a very good estimate of the total length of its uh, coastline, he started at Cornwall, uh, and he noted that the people living in Cornwall were uh, 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 mining tin, they were heating it uh, in furnaces, making lumps of tin about the size of knuckles. They were transporting it to a nearby, nearby island, possibly St. Michael's Mount, uh, and from there traders from Armorica, that's in the, the northern coast of France, were coming and purchasing it for onward sale. <coughs> he sailed along the south coast and he arrived at the other end at, a, at an area which was then called Cantion. Quite interesting, that's 320 BC. Uh, it was where a, a tribe called the Cantii uh, lived. Again, an interesting point, Canterbury is the only town or city in Britain which takes its name from an Iron Age tribe. And Kent is the only county which takes its name from an Iron Age tribe or a Celtic tribe. Anyway, Pythias went all uh, round uh, Britain. He also headed up beyond the north coast of Scotland to a place which he describes as Ultima Thule. Nobody knows what Ultima Thule was. Might be Orkney, might be the Shetlands, possibly even he went up to Iceland. But there's a great mystery about, uh, w w w about where it was. And I noticed that when a spaceship was recently launched to go off into the universe, um, looking at some, some distant star, the name which was given to it was Ultima Thule, the same sense of mystery that we have about Pythias's writing. <coughs> so anyway, there we are. <coughs> he went off, wrote an account about his visit to Britain uh, and our uh, metal mining and metalworking activities, and delivered it to his colleagues in the uh, Mediterranean. He was a Greek from Ma Marseille, which uh, by the fourth century BC was a Greek colony uh, uh, along the south coast of France. Well, <coughs> the, Brit the, the Greeks seem to have taken no more or no further interest in Britain and its minerals. Not so the Romans. Uh, as you all know very well, the Romans were imperialists and colonizers. Uh, unfortunately, imperialism and colonization is not now a very fashionable activity. So uh, I need always to put a disclaimer when I give a talk about Roman matters that this was, of course, all extremely terrible, but nevertheless, if we want to study Rome, uh, that is what was going on. They were not only uh, imperialists and colonizers, they were also slave owners. But it must be said that everyone else in the ancient world were slave owners, and they were all just as eager to be imperialists if they could, but none of them were as successful as uh, Rome was. <coughs> Rome acquired its empire very largely in the first century BC. It had defeated uh, Carthage in the Carthage Punic Wars earlier, but the great uh, empire building phase was the first century BC when Pompey uh, annexed the uh, Near East and, and Caesar ran this huge campaign across uh, Europe when he acquired, uh, annexed Gaul, the whole of Gaul, uh, 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 the whole of France and Belgium, as a Roman province. He would have liked to, co uh, to conquer Britain as well, but that was too much to ask for. He simply came here, did a bit of invading, as I previously described, and produced a description of Britain in his Gallic uh, War. Uh, but by then, uh, Caesar was bringing Britain into the uh, Roman sphere of interest, uh, uh, of influence. There was increasing trade between Britain and the continent. Britain had to pay customs dues to Rome on exports from Britain and imports to Britain. And there's quite a lot of description of, of Britain and what was going on in the writings of Caesar and Strabo in the late first century BC. Well, <coughs> clearly it was very tempting 
for the Romans to go ahead uh, and annex Britain as a province. A lot of scholars say that the purpose of annexing Britain was to get the, for the Romans to get their hands on our minerals. I don't think that's right. Uh, I, I don't think they knew the extent of our mineral deposits. I think it was purely a political manoeuvre because uh, Claudius needed to consolidate his position after becoming emperor in dubious circumstances. <clears throat> the only way he could consolidate his victory, his position, was by winning a great military victory. And the only place uh, available to be annexed as a province was Britain. In fact, Britain was the last major province to join the empire and the first major province to drop out. As I say uh, in my paragraph 12, once the Romans arrived here, they set about exploiting all the resources which they could find. And I've described the lead mining in my paragraph uh, 12. Uh, they, uh, the Roman authorities mined lead. They were mainly interested in the silver, which they used for making denarii, coins with which they paid the army. And very often, once they'd taken the, the uh, silver, they were happy to allow the lead to be mined by private contractors. Uh, of course, lead uh, had, uh, ha had great value for, uh, as a building material, and when mixed with copper, it could make bronze for sesterces. They were the small change of, of the Roman Empire. Now, <coughs> modern mine owners, of course, have to take great care of the environment, and they have to restore uh, land after they have completed their activities and the mine is exhausted. Oh, uh, I haven't said anything about this, uh, about that yet. Here is an Etruscan lampstand which is on display in the Ashmolean Museum. Uh, it's in the Etruscan Gallery and the curator of the Etruscan Gallery uh, is confident that that bronze lampstand is made using tin in the alloy exported from Britain. So it's an example of us sending uh, our, our uh, tin to Europe. Now, the uh, Roman, <coughs> the Roman uh, miners uh, dug their uh, tin mine, their, their lead mines, and then they left uh, this ugly Warren nature reserve where their mining had been in a complete mess. I just, I just took this photograph but if you wander around Ubley Warren a Nature Reserve, you can see a fair amount of chaos. No attempt to uh, restore the environment to what it was before the Romans extracted all the tin. Now, <coughs> the Romans occupied a former Iron Age site at Charterhouse uh, and established a large mining community there. Uh, Charterhouse acquired a fort and also an amphitheatre. <coughs> and here is a photograph of the amphitheatre. It must have been quite a large uh, mining community, generating quite a lot of lead for the Romans to bother to create an amphitheatre. It's not a terribly good photograph, um, but anyway, I, I took it a few, few years ago. Uh, and this was for the entertainment of the people who were working uh, in the lead mine at Charterhouse. The remains of the mining town itself are now uh, concealed between beneath a large field there. <coughs> Stamped ingots from that region show that legionary soldiers were overseeing the extraction of silver and lead from the Mendips. Uh, obviously, as I say, they were mainly interested in, in the lead. Uh, but we can't uh, infer, as I say in paragraph 14 of my handout, that the uh, Romans were uh, taking total control of everything. It does seem likely that private contractors took over all the mining, mining except that which was of interest to the Roman state. And as I say in my paragraph 15, uh, lead pigs produced uh, in Britain were stamped to show their place of origin and the lead pigs, the lead, ing lead ingots, which came from the Mendips, have the letters V-E-B stamped on them. That may well be an abbreviation for whatever the Romans called uh, what is now Ub Ubley, uh, uh, Ubley Park Nature Reserve. 
<coughs> now, uh, I have reached uh, paragraph uh, 16 of, of my skeleton argument. I say that I turn to uh, other mining operations. Both Romans and Britons extracted iron ore from, Kent, from the Weald, that's the Kent, Surrey, uh, and Sussex Weald. The Classis Britannica, the Roman fleet which guarded the shores of Britain, needed iron for the use of the navy uh, and on ships, uh, and undoubtedly uh, they were getting their iron from the Surrey, Sussex and Kent Weald, and they were controlling some of the mining operations there. Some scholars say the navy was running the whole thing, but that's a bit unlikely because iron was used for many purposes. The uh, navy would have required some iron, but there's no reason why they should take over the whole commercial operation. We can see stamp tiles uh, with reference to the classis Britannica, referring to this, the stamp of the classis Britannica, which shows that the Navy were involved in the operation, but we can't really draw any uh, further conclusions than that. And as I say in my uh, skeleton argument in paragraph 16, <coughs> um, iron was used for many purposes. I've listed some nails, chisels, hinges, tools, knives, spearheads, and all the other comforts of the ancient world. Why on earth should the Navy be doing all of that? So it's likely that private contractors were doing a lot of the uh, mining uh, and uh, 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 mining and <coughs> removal from ore of the uh, uh, along the Sussex Weald. Now, as I said in paragraph 17, Britain was an extremely expensive province to run. It was actually the most expensive province to run in the whole of the empire. Uh, we were a very rebellious lot. 12% um, uh, uh, of the Roman army was required to garrison Britain, which represented 4% of the Roman empire. Uh, of course, the, Bur the Boudican Revolution was an example of, of the trouble which we caused to the Roman authorities, but it is not the uh, only example. So we were a very expensive province to run, uh, and it seems to me that the Romans were uh, doing their best to recover what they could uh, and to exploit our minerals as much as they could uh, to try and cover the cost. But the evidence suggests that Britain as a province was not paying its way. There was a historian called Appian writing in the mid-2nd century uh, AD. And this was when the uh, Roman Empire was at its zenith, the, the period of the great, the, the great Roman emperors, Hadrian, uh, Antoninus, Pius, Marcus Aurelius, and so on. And Appian says that uh, Britain was not paying its way. It was more of a drain on the empire than it was a benefit. Anyway, expensive though we were to run, the Romans were extracting as much as, I could, as they could, and as I say in paragraph 17, they asserted with great insouciance that all minerals in the province belonged to the emperor, uh, uh, and the procurator would have uh, dealt with the financial side. The procurator was the financial administrator of the province, <coughs> So uh, once the army or the, the navy didn't need to run a particular mining or metalworking operation, the procurator would have licensed it out, he would have charged royalties or had some other, some other financial arrangement to ensure that the Roman uh, administrators were well paid. So here is a picture of one of the Roman procurators, a very famous procurator called Classicianus. Uh, as Eloise said earlier on, it's not a terribly good picture, but there he is. He was the procurator who had the job of sorting out the province's finances immediately after Boudicca's uh, revolution, a rebellion, because that rebellion caused massive destruction, burning down London, St Albans and Colchester, the major cities of the province, and inflicting widespread loss of life and it was Classicianus who had to pick up the pieces afterwards. And it seems he was very, po very popular in the province. 
After his death, he was buried in London and a large part of his tombstone has been found. It was found in two pieces uh, and there came a time when the two bits were put together. You can see them I in the British Museum uh, 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 and uh, it was put there by his wife. Anyway, uh, procurators like Classicianus were negotiating with the mine, the private contractors who were exploiting many of the mineral resources in this country and he was ensuring that the Roman authorities got a very good deal. I make the point in paragraph 18 that a ready supply of metals was vital for the functioning of the empire and I list some of the things they were used for, uh, armament and so forth. Also, although one shouldn't say it, uh, iron was also used for making slave chains. I don't know if any of you have been to the Nero exhibition at the British Museum. There's quite a lot there about uh, Britain, including the Brunical Revolution, and there is, a, there is a, a complete iron slave train chain which has been recovered from Britain. Uh, you can see that, that that's made out of iron as, uh, as well. I photographed it on my phone, but didn't get as far as putting it in this set of pictures. Um, and I say in paragraph 19, by the end of the first century AD, that is, mines were established at key sites across the province. Uh, and then I uh, give some examples, copper at Anglesey uh, 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 and in North Wales, gold at Dolo, coffee in South Wales, iron ore in the East Midlands and the Forest of Dean and the Weald, lead all over the place, tin in Cornwall. Uh, and generally, you will find the, uh, uh, you will find the remains of uh, Roman forts guarding the, uh, the mining communities so that the Roman authorities could keep an eye on what was going on. Now, uh, I make the point in paragraph 20 that I made actually earlier on that the blacksmith was a very respected craftsman in the ancient world. And in Britain, there were both civilian and military blacksmiths. Indeed, they were needed to produce a huge amount of items. If you go to the museum in Bath, you can see the tombstone of a military blacksmith. And his name was Julius uh, Vitalis. His uh, uh, CV is set out in his tombstone. It's very well preserved. And he served in the 20th Legion for nine years, and he died at the age of 29. The inscription says that the guild of blacksmiths paid for his monument. Now that must have been quite an expensive operation. Uh, uh, quarrying a tombstone and then carving a lengthy inscription such as we see giving the uh, life story of Julius Vitalis would have been a very expensive operation. So he was much respected. Uh, and the guild of smiths was an important professional body. It was perhaps the ancient precursor uh, master of your uh, uh, worshipful company of the founders. And they were also a generous body. They paid for the, uh, for the creation and the establishment of Julius Vitalis's tombstone. And if you go down to Chichester, you can see a very fine inscription in North Street you walk up North Street starting at Chichester Cross and you look to your right you will see the assembly rooms and in the wall of the assembly rooms is a first century Roman inscription which has survived. It commemorates, it says, it, it's, a, it's an inscription to, uh, to two gods, Neptune and some, some other uh, important deity and it refers to Togidubnus who was the so-called client king administering that part of Britain in the period immediately after the conquest. And you can see at the bottom that this, uh, this uh, tablet was paid for and erected by the Guild of Smiths. So I hope you will take comfort in the fact that the ancient predecessors of the worshipful company of founders were doing good works and erecting monuments uh, 2,000 years ago. Anyway, let me now turn on to Inch Tutil and paragraph 21 of my skeleton argument. 
there was a governor who came to Britain in the late first century called Agricola. Uh, he, we know a very great deal about Agricola's life because he had the very, uh, uh, he, he had the good fortune or perhaps the good sense to ensure that his daughter married Tacitus, the famous Roman historian. Uh, and Tacitus, uh, like all good sons-in-law, was most respectful of his uh, father-in-law. And I commend Tacitus to all my sons-in-law. Um, Tacitus uh, it was, uh, I think, one of the greatest Roman historians. Uh, he tells us a lot about Britain in his annals and his histories, but he also wrote a uh, biography of his father-in-law, Agricola, which includes a very great deal about Britain, because Agricola served as governor in this province for two consecutive three-year terms, which was unusual. He was undoubtedly a very capable general. Uh, he extended uh, the control of the Roman authorities, not only up to the top of Britain and where Hadrian's Wall was going to be built, but also into much of Scotland as well. And he won a, a, a famous bat, uh, a victory at a battle called Mons Gropius. No one knows where Mons Gropius is, but historians love arguing about it, and many a PhD thesis has been devoted to that topic. Anyway, after his great victories in Scotland, Agricola had built a fortress, or he got his chaps to build a fortress, on the north bank of the River Tay. This was to be a fortress for the 20th Legion because Agricola had the marvellous idea that we would take control of Scotland and so we'll have a legion planted uh, 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 just above the River Tay uh, 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 and uh, controlling the area, supported in the usual way by auxiliary soldiers. Auxiliary soldiers were soldiers conscripted from other parts of the empire who had to come along and serve where they were told to and provide assistance to the legions was roughly one auxiliary soldier for each uh, legionary soldier. Anyway, this marvellous uh, legionary fortress was built on the north bank of the River Tay for the 20th Legion. Then uh, uh, Agricola's term of office came to an end. He was recalled to Rome. Now, what happened after Agricola's campaigns is less clear uh, because uh, Tacitus' biography of uh, Agricola doesn't tell us what happened when he was back in Rome, doesn't tell us what was happening here, uh, and also the relevant part of Tacitus' histories which would cover that period has unfortunately been lost. But what we do know is that very soon after Agricola was recalled to Rome, the Romans withdrew from Scotland and they established their northern frontier of Britain along, uh, the, uh, along the line where, in due course, Hadrian's Wall was going to be built. Tacitus is very cross about that. Although we haven't got the relevant part of his histories, there's another bit of his histories where he says he won't repeat what he's put in the passage now he lost, but he comments that the Roman authorities lost Britain. He says, Armisit lost. Now, obviously, they didn't lose Britain, but what Tacitus was complaining about was the abandonment of Scotland after Agricola had withdrawn. And I must say, I can see Tacitus's point, because the Romans built this magnificent fortress, and then as soon as they'd finished it, uh, they had to abandon it. Now, there's the, the tombstone of Julius Vitalis, by the way. You can see what, what a splendid description it was. Now, here is Institutio Fortress. This is an artist's uh, impression of Institutio Fortress. Uh, you can't see any of it on the ground now. It's all been, uh, the earth's been put back. But the base of the fortress has been excavated, and it's possible to trace the total outline of the fortress and where the buildings within the fortress uh, were constructed. Indeed, Inch Tutil is the only fortress in the entire Roman Empire where we have the complete ground plan. So this is quite an interesting uh, artist's impression. It's also the only fortress in the Roman Empire <coughs> which was abandoned as soon as it was built. 
Now, moving into a territory, taking control of it, and then withdrawing again presents some problems. Uh, the Americans have recently discovered that in Afghanistan. One problem is what do you do with all your kit? The Americans left all their kit in Afghanistan and it's now being used uh, gleefully by the Taliban. The Romans, dare I say it, were slightly more canny as imperialists than uh, America. When the Romans withdrew from each Tutil, they buried all their kit at great depth and the Caledonian tribes uh, never got hold of it. Uh, they buried no less than 700,000 nails and 10 tons of other iron objects. Uh, they weren't discovered by the uh, Scottish tribesmen. They have, however, been discovered in recent times by modern archaeologists. Now, here, there we are. Uh, here are three of the 700,000 nails uh, which were buried at Inchtutil. Very interesting, uh, as you can see from my uh, skeleton argument, the Inchtutil nails are remarkably uniform, suggesting that standard tools were used in their production, and they comprise an alloy of iron with a small amount of carbon. In other words, the uh, Roman blacksmiths were creating an early form of steel. And there you can see three of the nails. Now, I gave a lecture on Roman Britain generally um, a, a few weeks ago. Uh, and at the, at the Q&A session at the end of that lecture, uh, one of the people there, who I think is here now, Alan Denny, uh, stood up and said, and asked me a few tricky questions about the Institutional Nails. And he then said he got one. He got several of them. He bought them. And uh, Alan very kindly gave me one of the inch two till nails. So there you have a photograph of three of them, and here you have one. It's now my prized possession, and at the end of this lecture, when you've all finished buying the book, um, uh, I hope you will all come and have a look at this nail. How am I doing for time? I, I think my time is nearly up, so I will move swiftly on. Anyway, this is a real uh, Roman nail from inch two till, and extremely interesting. Then I've got a section about gold mining, uh, which was done at Dolo Kothi. Uh, the Romans dug an open cast pit. They cut mine shafts into the hillside. And I describe you can still go and see the Roman mines. And if you want to get out again, you'd be well advised to take a guide, because the, uh, the passages down there are quite confusing. Uh, and when you leave the main uh, Roman mine, you go up steps carved into the hillside by the Romans almost certainly carved by their slaves. But anyway, up you go and you see uh, light at the top. Then in paragraph 24, I describe the procedure for extracting gold from the uh, quartz, which was mined. You need to do it with a lot of water uh, and gold dust sinks to the bottom. And near to the Roman mines, you can see a series of leaps and ponds which the Romans carved into, uh, dug in the hillside for the purpose of processing the, uh, the uh, quartz uh, and making gold. Uh, and there's a remain, the remains of a water wheel used uh, and panning, uh, pan, panning uh, cradle at the National Museum of Wales. Then in paragraph 25, I deal with the amount of gold which seems to have been extracted. The fact, uh, and I make the point at the end of paragraph 25, that the fact that Britain boasted uh, one uh, gold mine yielding such modest returns does not suggest that the province was somehow paying its way or was a source of wealth for Rome. So if I may draw the threads together, the Romans, when they came here, extracted and used what metals and minerals they could. They did that because they were here, but the Romans were not occupying Britain because of its mineral resources. They arrived here for political purposes, and it was then politically impossible for them to withdraw, much though Nero would have liked to do so. Uh, well, that's my account of mining and metalworking in ancient Britain. I have taken the liberty of bringing with me uh, my history of Roman Britain, 
which I've done my best to make interesting by including some little asides and the odd uh, joke. Uh, all the royalties from this book are going to a charity called Classics for All, which promotes and funds the teaching of classics in state schools with an emphasis on areas of social deprivation. Uh, I very much hope that uh, uh, a goodly number of you will be persuaded to uh, buy copies. They're 20 pounds each. You can put 20 pounds into the tin, uh, or there's a slip in there saying how you can pay uh, by uh, direct debit. But don't worry, I'm not making any profit out of this myself. Uh, it's all going to a much better cause than myself. So uh, do have a look at that, and if you fancy it, buy it. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you find that interesting. Good. certainly be to good use. David, thank you very much for hosting this evening. Thank you for this book, which I will read with great interest. I love books like this. And thank you also for your donation to Classics for All, which will be much appreciated. Now, I suggest what we do is we go upstairs for a pretty grand meal to drink uh, while the room is adjusted for shepherd's pie to be enjoyed. And uh, I look forward to seeing everybody back down here. There will be an opportunity for questions uh, and unless people are running away now and have a burning question, uh, I hope everyone will be able to stay for their briefly and we'll have questions during our shepherd's pie. But uh, in the meantime, please put your hands together in appreciation for some. Two 